every part of the, of the world, north, south, east, and west, has states, sovereign states. They cling to sovereignty. The notion of sovereignty is the single most universally shared norm in world politics. So that's true. The Westphalian projects from 1648 to today, today has been about the promulgating and, and elaboration and institutionalization of sovereignty. And that's what China has anchored itself to. That's all true. But there's been this other project that I've been discussing, which is the heart of my book, really, and that is the, the, the project associated with the liberal ascendancy, the liberal project of building open, uh, open rule-based order. Um, uh, and uh, this has been, for the most part, congruent and consistent with sovereignty. Because think of Woodrow Wilson. I uh, teach in a building called the Woodrow Wilson School. So I, I, every talk I give, I have to at least mention Woodrow Wilson. And I'm fascinated by him. I collect uh, you know, I, all the books written about Wilson, all of this. Um, but he was, in his statements about self-determination and about his anti-imperialism, was, was in fact using Westphalian norms uh, to attach to a, uh, for pr the pursuit of a liberal project. So he was taking the, the, the norms of self-determination, non-discrimination, that all states should have their own state. Uh, uh, he was inconsistent about that, but that's what, that was the, 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 the Wilson, Wilson vision. So, so there is a congruence, but sometime in the latter half of the 20th century, and I'll, I'll blame one person, a woman named Eleanor Roosevelt. She uh, was the the, the, the real figure behind the Universal Declaration on Human Rights that really s s planted the seed for this notion that individuals have rights that, that, that are to be recognized by, the, by, the, by humanity and they are rooted in your, your, your humanity. And, uh, th and if states abuse those rights or jeopardize those rights, the international community has some, some obligation to to, to, um, to assist or to respond. And so that, of course, kind of got muddled for half a century, but uh, in the post-Cold War period, you started to get, and of course, the way the, the Holocaust and the way in which uh, the, the, the War Crimes, Crimes Tribunal, we held soldiers individually accountable, we were starting to break down sovereignty even then. But of course, it kind of became frozen for half a century because of the Cold War, and then, because of terrorism, because of, 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 of Rwanda, Srebrenica, we can't, we can't stand by another Srebrenica. I, can modern Western uh, democratic leaders stand by when they would have the, the forces to go in and, and, uh, and prevent a bloodbath? Well, that's violating sovereignty. So you're in this, this territory where the liberal agenda of a, of, with, with notions of an international community that say, that's, that's, that's putting itself in favor of upholding human rights and protections uh, stand by when those things happen. But if, if your answer is no, then, you're, then you have opened the door for compromising sovereignty. My argument would be we just can't close that door. We have, we've already, our, our, our morals don't allow us uh, and my good friend Henry Kissinger. No, I, there are realists who say you just have you you can't. It's sovereignty is sovereignty, I mean, and and uh, I think even some of the hard boiled realists, uh, like uh, like Henry Kissinger, would would in fact say that that yes, there are these moments where it really is even necessary. But but certainly, most of us would say that we can't close the door on that kind of action. What what we can do is try to make as consensual and widespread as possible, agreements about how we respond, who responds under what conditions. Mm -hmm.